Shalom. Today we are continuing on our study of the correlation between the astronomical signs that are on the ecliptic, uh, what some people consider to be astrological signs, and the Hebrew months. Indeed, in Psalm 19 it is written, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor knowledge where their voice is not heard. And we have discussed uh, many uh, mosaic uh, floors which are uh, in, in Tiberias in that vicinity of synagogues. These are ancient synagogues, maybe third century, where these astronomical signs are um, illustrated and their names are with them as we can see. So today we're continuing on to the 10th month which is known as the month of Tevet in modern Hebrew. It, the names of the months came with the people out of Babylon but we see that some of them are listed in Tanakh. So in Esther 2.16 so Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tevet, in the seventh year of his reign. Uh, they don't really know the origin for the name of this month. It might possibly be Tov, which is good, or maybe something to do with Tabah with sinking, but it's not definite. We see some events which happened in the tenth month. In 2 Kings 25, 1, And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. So this is a critical time in the history of the people. This is a siege against Jerusalem, which happened uh, about two and a half years before the actual fall in Jerusalem and the exile of the people of the southern kingdom of Judah from the land. So this is sort of a beginning of the end. Ezekiel thirty three twenty one, And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one had escaped out of Jerusalem, came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. So this is reporting the same event. As a result of the fact that the city was besieged on this day, it has been declared um, a fast day. And there is some variation within the actual reporting, whether it was the ninth or the 10th day of the 10th month, but it is considered to be a fast day and it's documented here in Zechariah 8:19. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. So the fourth month here is the month um, that we would call Tammuz. And this fast commemorates the beginning of the three weeks uh, between the straits. It's called Ben HaMetzarim. And it is the day that the city began to fall about two and a half years after the uh, siege that we're talking about of the 10th month. The fifth month is the month of Av, and uh, probably you know the many sad events which happened to the people on the ninth day of the month of Av. When we get around to the calendar, uh, I'll do a presentation on the ninth of Av. The fast of the seventh month, even though Yom HaKippurim is a day of affliction, which is considered to be a, a fast day, and that is in the seventh month, but this is not the fast that's being referred to here. The fast of the seventh month here is the third day um, of the month, or the month of Tishrei, which is called Tzom Gedalia, and it is for the, uh, it commemorates the assassination of the governor of Jerusalem at the time. So that is the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month is the siege of Jerusalem, probably about 588 BCE. Um, 
However, Zechariah encourages us that the fast days will be changed to days of mourning. So what we can see between uh, Esther and the siege of Jerusalem, we see somehow that the people are being cut off from, uh, in Esther's case, she's being cut off from living among her people and the siege, the people are cut off from the land, the people in Jerusalem are cut off from the land and eventually they will be exiled and cut off from their people and their land altogether. The sign for the month of Tevet is Capricorn. And this is a very old uh, star constellation. Usually um, we can see it traced all the way back even to uh, proto before Greek mythology and the very earliest Greek mythology that there was such a character that was half goat and half fish. Um, it might apply to the story of the god of Pan, the, um, the Greek god, who at one point is being chased and tries to hide himself in the water. And so he gives himself a fish tail and he jumps off into the water. Obviously, such a bizarre creature uh, could not exist. Um, as Tevye said, uh, a bird can marry a fish, but where would they live? So this is half land animal and half sea animal. It's a very, very strange looking thing. It is uh, in Hebrew called Gidi, which means goat or kid of the goats. So in Leviticus 16, 7 and 8, these are some of the rules for Yom HaKippurim, for the Day of Atonement. We see these two goats. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat. And we know that the goat is a clean animal and it is accepted as an offering in any situation. Uh, it's interesting that the cognate root for kafar, kuf, pe, resh, which is the three Hebrew letters that you see there, um, which means atonement, it means a covering, is in the English coming back to Greek or Latin uh, cognate for the name of the constellation, which is Capricorn. You see the letters line up. So the word Gedi, uh, and sometimes it's um, uh, paired up with the, with the word Ez. So we see this in Genesis twenty-seven sixteen, and she, speaking of Jacob's mother, put the skins of the kids of the goats. So a gadi is always from a goat. There are other words that are translated goat and other words that are translated as kid, but the name of the constellation in Hebrew thought is gadi. So it's the kids from the goats. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. Um, he is trying to uh, disguise himself, or she's trying to disguise him as his brother Esau so that uh, he can get the blessing. Exodus 23:19. The first of the first fruits of the land shall thou bring into the house of Yahweh thy God. Thou shalt not see a kid in his mother's milk. This is a commandment that I think appears about three times and has been um, extended out by rabbinical sources to forbid the eating of milk and meat at the same time. There's some question whether what's really meant here is a, um, if it refers to a pagan ritual that the people were not supposed to practice or something like that. We do see that Abraham, in spite of the fact that it is written that he kept all of God's mitzvot and all of his Torah, all his commandments, that he did serve the angels milk and meat together. So that seems like maybe there's a little conflict there in his behavior. Uh, the word gadi comes from a root gada, which means to separate. And so we can see that the kid, the baby goat, is the one that separates, separated from his mother. And so maybe just out of some kind of kindness, this commandment is given not to boil the baby in the mother's milk. 
The root gada has another um, meaning as a noun uh, in Joshua 3.15. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. And so the separation is translated here as the banks of the river. The, um, the bank is the area that separates the water area from the land. So again, there's an idea of, of separating here. Another related root is Gadad, uh, Gimel Dalad Dalad. And we see in Deuteronomy 14.1, Ye are the children of Yahweh your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. So Gadad has to do with, with cutting in the sense that when you cut something, it separates that thing into different pieces. In Micah 5.1, it's translated, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops, he that laid siege against us, they shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. And one of the 12 tribes is God, Gimel Dalid, and it's translated often as troop. And the idea is those people cut themselves off from the other people. They separate themselves for the, for the express purpose of accomplishing some uh, military operation. So that is the idea of them gathering themselves. It's not the normal word for gather at all. The idea is that they're trooping up, they're cutting themselves off from the rest of the people. So in the beginning, the goat is acceptable for any kind of sacrifice, including the Passover sacrifice, as is um, written in Exodus 12.5. Talking about the Passover sacrifice, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. So either one is an acceptable sacrifice. So what exactly is this picture of this Capricorn, this half land and half water animal and something that can't really exist? The fish, we've done a separate series on, which you can um, see uh, in in the presentation entitled their line hath gone out in the second part we talk about the fish the fish is always the um, represents the Hebrew people and so we have this ancient mythological idea of a goat which is eventually going to be cut off or separated adapting himself this tail of a fish and trying to live in the water that such a thing cannot exist. What does this show us? That, that the goats and the sheep, as we know, are living together even until the very end of the age. And then Yeshua teaches us from Matthew 25, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, which is the place of honor, but the goats on the left, which is a place of dishonor. So throughout the month of Tevet, we have this picture. In fact, the month of Tevet begins on the last few days of Hanukkah, which is this season of light. And it goes from the season of light into the darkest time of the year, the dead of, of winter. In a rudimentary agricultural sense, we are cut off from the long days of sunlight, from the growing time, even from the land itself. Just as the people are about to be cut off in the tenth of Tevet from, from the rest of their country, and they're fixing to go in exile, they'll be cut off from their land. And so the picture of Tevet shows us this, and we're, we see this mixture of the goats and the sheep during this time, there's not enough light to discern who is who. But by faith, we keep walking, and we know that um, the sun is coming back again in its fullness because Yahweh has promised it. And then eventually, we know that the exile will be over, the people will be separated, 
and we will return to the land. Praise his holy name. So while we're waiting for that time, Tasimita'inayim al-Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.